Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. You've made the right choice. Uh, I'm Zach Ruskin. I'm the marketing coordinator at Book Passage, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all. As you know, these events and their continued patronage is why we're allowed to have so many awesome authors like Mary Rose, so we really appreciate you being here. Uh, I'm a self-confessed roachaholic. Uh, I think the first time I heard about Mary Roach, I was watching the show Six Feet Under. It's about a uh, family of undertakers, and one gives another Mary's book Stiff, which I subsequently ran out, bought, read, and then began the long two-year wait for her next book, Spook, which I promptly ran out, bought, read, and so on with Bonk and Packing for Mars, and finally, Gold. Mary's books last me a grand total of 48 hours, at which point I take a day of mourning, <laughs> and then I begin the arduous process of waiting for her to write another one, <laughs> which she has promised me she is. Uh, Mary is a wonderful science writer, and she has the greatest gift, which is to infuse humor and simplicity into her explanations of things. Uh, she is the high school science teacher I wish I had. Uh, she is also remarkably talented at footnotes, a lost art that she has brought back to the forefront. The book she's discussing with us tonight is called Gulp, Adventures on the Elementary Canal, and it deals with the digestive system and the lovely things surrounding it. This is uh, this is the kind of event while we move the kids center from there to here because we're going to hear some stuff that they don't need to know about. <laughs> and with that, it is my great pleasure to welcome back to Book Passage, Mary Roach. Exciting day. I'm a step grandparent as of today. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I may be a little sort of sleep deprived and scattered, but I'm always a little bit that way. You won't be able to tell. Um, anyway, so I don't know. Cause I always like to um, uh, begin talks, or lately I have been. Um, I don't know if some people might not be familiar with me and the kinds of things that I do. So by way of warning, I share a little story, and that is that not long ago, uh, I was at the, uh, the TED Talks, and they do this thing where when you get there, they have you fill out a little form so you can join sort of the TED community, and there's a form that you fill out, and part of it, there's a little square where you can upload something, and I have a little bio that I use, and I uploaded that little bio of myself, and um, I tried to save it, and it said, the text that you have entered has been deemed offensive and cannot be saved. <laughs> By way of warning, <laughs> um, this book is uh, this book is about the Alimentary Canal, which is a kind of an old timey term for everything between the nose and the tail, the pie hole and the food chute. <laughs> the whole nine yards, and it is about nine yards, although that is not the origin of the phrase. Not the whole nine yards. Nobody seems to be able to agree on what that phrase comes from. Um, anyway, so it, it uh, and I found. It, say, well, why would you be interested in that? Like, you know what? I don't think I'm the only one. I think, I think that I'm generally interested in the things that everyone is interested in until they realize you're not supposed to be interested in these things. So um, I, I, I sort of, um, the elementary canal, it's a taboo area. And I like things that are taboo. People, people are a little like, oh, that's kind of fascinating, but it's also a little gross, and maybe I won't go there. And one of the good things about the fact that most people don't go there is that um, other writers don't go there, so it's all left for me. I'm like the bottom feeder. <laughs> 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 and all of a sudden, that stuff drips down, and I'll take that. I'll do that. Um, the, and, and the elementary canal, um, people people are grossed out by people like saliva all the way on down to the other end. Who's good? People are really, uh, the, the, the overriding sentiment is revulsion. And I really, I, I would like to replace a little of the revulsion and disgust with respect and, and awe. 
And uh, so that's, a little, that's my goal. And by way of doing that, I'm going to read you something that I quite like. I did not write it. It is from a 1962 issue of the American Journal of Proctology. <laughs> By Dr. Walter C. Bornmeier. Where is he now? I don't know. Uh, okay. They say that man has succeeded where the animal fails because of the clever use of his hands. Yet when compared to the hands, the anal sphincter is far superior. <laughs> if you place into your cupped hands a mixture of fluid, solid, and gas, and then through an opening at the bottom, try to let only the gas escape, you will <laughs> fail. <laughs> Yet, the anal sphincter can do it. <laughs> the sphincter can apparently differentiate between solid, liquid, and gas. It can apparently tell whether its owner is alone or with someone else. <laughs> down or up. <laughs> no other muscle of the body is such a protector of the dignity of man and so ready to come to his relief. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, a brief round of applause for the human anal sphincter. <laughs> enables me to read this footnote, which I quite uh, enjoy doing. It has to do with a, a phrase, it's a medical term, per anum, which means by way of the anus. You know, you can deliver medi medication that way if you have to, uh, per, uh, per anum. There's also a term, per annum, <laughs> two ends, which means yearly. The correct answer to the question, what is the birth rate per anum, is zero. <laughs> One hopes. <laughs> the internet provides many fine examples of the perils of confusing these two. <laughs> the investment firm that offers 10% interest per annum <laughs> is likely to have about as many takers as the Nigerian screen white writer who describes himself as, quote, capable of writing six movies per annum. <laughs> was Sri Lankan importer whose classified ad declares 36 metric tons of garlic wanted per annum. <laughs> uh, it goes on, but anyway, so um, I just like to share that because there's no real reason. Um, anyway, so the, the book is, uh, like most of my books, I try, I try to have a, a, a setting, a place to go to kind of bring these things to life, you know, because I've got stops all along the way. Well, not everywhere. I think if it's not, if I can't find something fun to do with it, I kind of skip it. It's certainly not, a, it's not a um, comprehensive guide to the elementary canal. The liver, oh yeah, boring, I'll just skip the liver. Uh, the small intestine got a little bit of short shrift as well, but um, Anyways, I made a, I started the mouth, the nose and the mouth. Uh, there's a oh, spent some time with a there's a woman who's a I would describe it as a olfactory forensics expert. You can take a glass of wine or beer or or olive oil she's working on these days, and she can sniff and taste it. She can go, oh yeah, okay, I know what went wrong here. It's like it's amazing. So just the vibe, like oh this this has a hospital flavor, this beer, that means you used some um, chlorine, chlorine and water in your, in your process. I mean, it's, it's a, it's, she's like a, it's a kind of magic. Uh, she has a very, very educated nose. So that was the nose, which is, of course, very important in, in flavor and the experience of food. Um, and then I, I spent some time at a pet food tasting panel. Um, <laughs> uh, pet food, there are expert panels of dogs and cats that are employed to taste and, and give feedback, which is trickier because they can't fill out a form. <laughs> and you have to read the cues differently. For example, when a, one of the ways that a dog says, I love this food, is to throw up. <laughs> so they eat it so fast that they throw up. And you have to be able to go, okay, that's not a bad thing, throw up. Um, for the stomach, I spent some time with a competitive, uh, a man, a uh, scientist who brought competitive eaters into the hospital, lined up 36 hot dogs on the side, bury them, put them in front of a fluoroscope, looked at what was going on, which was um, fascinating. Uh, and then, okay, the, 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 the intestines, we moved on through the intestines and uh, 
flat three chapters on flatus, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you, got your, you got your flammability, your odor, and your volume, and then how you study it. So, um, <laughs> so then we get to the rectum, and I thought, well, where could I go? Who could I talk to for the rectum? And I'm not, you know, I never want, I didn't want this to be about um, diseases and illnesses. This is about a, you know, a healthy set of tubes and pipes for the most part. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to go look at, uh, you know, it's not going to be about um, a proctologist's practice. I mean, I have nothing against proctologists. In fact, I love proctologists. But, um, I thought, okay, what would be, let's, what is the rectum? The rectum is a storage unit, essentially. It's a place to park material uh, that you need to empty. It's like a compost bin. We need to empty this, but we don't have to do it right now. We can finish our talk. <laughs> Watch the rest of the movie. You don't have to get up and get a compost bin. So the rectum, a yeah, storage unit that and we should all be so we should be glad. So I thought, all right, well, I know a storage unit. What about those uh, drug mules and people who smuggle using uh, it, it, the, the slang in prison is prison wallet. It's another pocket. It's another pocket, a secret pocket. So I called up thinking that. And I called the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation <laughs> one fine day, and I got the public affairs guy on the phone, and I thought for sure he would hang up on me. I said, you know, I explained myself as best I could. I'm doing this book. I have a chapter on the rectum, a storage facility. I know you guys at Avenal State Prison have heard. I mean, he put me through the people at Avenal State Prison eventually. But um, so the, the VR guy, he said, uh, yeah, you know, um, we do have a problem. Speaking of cell phones. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Not that where the sun don't shine. I'm going to for that cell phone. Uh, so I said, well, um, I, this is what I'm trying to do. And I thought maybe, uh, I know you, you people that prisons have some serious issues with uh, rectal smuggling. And he said, oh, yeah, we actually, at an all-state prison, we have some cell phone smuggling issues. People bringing them into the prison because they're not allowed, they're conducting business, lots of smuggling going on on phones. And, and, and he said, and I thought, well, they'll let me talk to you know, the guards or something. He said, oh, we've got, a, we've got, some, we've got a guy you could talk to who's just sort of renowned here from his talents. <laughs> you have to come and talk to him. And he said, and he said um, will four hours be enough? <laughs> Stranger about his rectum, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then that was uh, it. Turned out he turned out to be in for murder. And he was a fascinating. He was. It was a very. Uh, there were some things on my list I crossed off when I learned that he was a murderer. Like let's not go too deeply into the <laughs> is rectal smuggling a form of what the journal Homosexuality calls masked anal manipulation. Let's cross that right off the list. And this brings me to a special offer tonight. Um, <laughs> for anyone who buys, who buys two books, doesn't have to be gulped, any two books, uh, I had these uh, special, this is a microfiber, this is a little cell phone pouch, and it happens to be the same size as the human rectum. <laughs> and I had it printed up, it has the first line of the chapter, uh, which says, uh, should circumstance prevent a man from carrying his cigarettes and cell phone in his pants pocket, the rectum provides a workable <laughs> <laughs> And I um, had these made, and the people at the, it's a little company, and they just, they, they asked absolutely no questions. <laughs> 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 just like, yeah, when you need it. <laughs> so, uh, so, and I would, I, I feel a little chintzy for making you buy two books, but this, the, the cost of one of these bags is actually my entire loyalty for a book. <laughs> but I have to buy two books, the real one, uh, while supplies last. Um, anyway, let's talk a little, let's get out of the far end and move up a little to a more respectable area of the elementary canal. And that, uh, the mouth, uh, a lot of interesting, a lot of interesting science, that, uh, uh, there's a whole field of science called oral processing. About how you chew and what you're doing. What you're doing is you're taking a cracker and you're taking it apart and then putting it back together in a form in which you can swallow it, called a bolus. You're creating, you're building boluses in your mouth, which just is not. Uh, the word bolus. I do love the word bolus, so that became my favorite 
Jordan, who would be a good heavy metal band later. <laughs> <laughs> Opening for Slayer. <laughs> uh, but uh, and, and the, uh, there's a, there are people who study saliva. I found this, this beautiful, I don't know what I expected the saliva researcher to look like, but it was not a beautiful and fashionable Italian woman. But I found this woman, Erica Saletti, and she has a passion for saliva. She would get excited about it. She would be talking about the antimicrobial, antibacterial properties, and she'd say, and you know, even some of the breakdown elements are antimicrobial. It's amazing. She pounded on the table. <laughs> uh, and uh, in her lab, she has ways to gather saliva. For example, there's two different kinds. There's stimulated saliva, which is when you chew. It's stimulated, and it's really. It just looks like it's clear. It's it's 99% water. It's it. Is sparkling and pretty in a beaker. You can collect it by chewing on, um, it was an Italian company, Il Tamponi. It's like if you're chewing on a tampon, it absorbs it all. <laughs> and you put it in a centrifuge and you spit it all out. You have a little beaker of, it looks like water. And I said to Erica Saletti, uh, I said, so would you drink that? She said, no. I said, come on. It's, she, I said, I know, even me, and I won't do it. You, you peep, there is a taboo that is fascinating because the taboo. It's not just saliva, it's, it's all of the bodily fluids, um, some more than others. But uh, <laughs> when, when they're in their, inside our body, and they're part of us, the thing we cherish most, they're fine, and as soon as they leave the body, they're disgusting. Mm -hmm. You know, they're ours. There was a, a researcher, Paul Rosen, who studies disgust, and he did this wonderful <laughs> experiment. We had people, imagine your favorite soup, a bowl of soup. <clears throat> How likely are you to want to eat this? And the people would say, like, oh, 10 out of 10. And then he goes, okay, now imagine spitting in this bowl of soup. Now how likely are you to want to eat it? It's like down to one. No, even though you're going to put it in your mouth, you're going to mix it with your saliva in your mouth, and you're fine with that uh, outside the body. So you can kind of, and you, it's interesting, you can map the limits of the self. Like if you stick your tongue out and then pull it back in, you're still, if you chew your food, stick it out, pull it back in, that's okay. On the lips, yeah, it's starting to need a little bit of a gray area. Uh, and the other thing I love is that you um, you extend the boundaries of yourself to include your family and loved ones. Like you stick your tongue in your loved one's mouth, your spouse or whatever. Uh, you know, that that you know, that's a lot we have no problem with, or, or your child. Uh, so you kind of extend the boundaries of you to include. Um, so uh, it's a. Uh, <laughs> She's a little concerned about that. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought, I thought, we, had our first, I thought we had our our first uh, victim here. <laughs> um, anyway, so the, the, it is a substance that, uh, and the science of it is fascinating as well. But, the, but just it, it could get a little philo philosophical, you know, the boundaries of the, the self, and and, and also um, uh, there's a, a chapter that has to do with uh, the microbiome, all the bacteria you have in you, uh, and. I was talking with this uh, researcher who does bacteria therapy or fecal transplants, um, <laughs> and which are very effective cures for certain infections in the colon. And he was telling me, for, for every one cell of you, there are nine cells of them, and, you know, the microbiome bacteria in you. Uh, and he said, it's really a question of who owns who. Uh, it's re it's uh, he said, you can't think of them as just interlopers. They are a functioning organ of your body. And so it's, just, it's so, it's really interesting. Um, the publicity efforts for this book were not without their challenges. <laughs> 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 um, my publicist, my fabulous publicist, Aaron, uh, at a certain point organized a dinner in New York when the hardback came out. She said, um, uh, well, so about me how you journalists, food journalists and writers coming, and, and you're going to do a talk. And, I, and so I thought, oh, okay. And I said, I said that cool. So I was trying to think, what will I say? So I wrote Aaron an email. Hi, Aaron. Should I tie the content of my talk and the book to the menu for the meal? It would be really easy. Just make sure there's beans on the menu so I can predict what will happen in five hours, whether men or women are more flagellant. And I can introduce people to topics like tooth pack an intraoral bolus rolling, and the miraculous <laughs> gush of saliva that protects your tooth enamel when you drink something acidic. She wrote back almost immediately. <laughs> Dear Mary, <laughs> I love that you're having fun with this. <laughs> but I 
I do think, for the purposes of this lunch, we don't want to be too graphic. <laughs> Perhaps we want to highlight the olive oil tasting chapter. Unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> Aaron is not here tonight. <laughs> so uh, we can talk a little bit uh, about uh, flatulence. And I talk I bring this up not because I uh, have the mind of Oh, no, boy, I may possibly have that. But uh, because it is, uh, what I love about this topic is the creativity that has gone into figuring out ways to collect flatus, intestinal gas that is, collect it, measure it, study it. Uh, and, and we're talking going all the way back to there was a guy uh, in Paris in the 1800s. Um, and I reported this, this was interesting, I had reported on this in Stiff, uh, there was a, ch I had a chapter on the guillotine and um, this notion of when you uh, cut off the head, is there a moment where the brain is still functioning and there's a, an awareness of the situation. And there was just these guys that were hired to uh, do this, like grab the heads in the basket, run off and to do tests upon them. And yeah, I know. Uh, so that was Stiff, and then years and years later, I come upon around the same era, same this is a French journal, the guy who got the bodies. Well, the, the, the guy got the bodies for experimentation. And one of the things he did was document intestinal gas. And this was the reason he, he was he was so excited about this is uh, French prisoners are given a final meal and they and they knew exactly like they had one guy had lentils and one had, had uh, cheese and bread. And and he so he knew what they'd eaten and then he could he took um, gas from the uh, intestinal tract and along the way and, and figured out what we tried to figure out what it was and, and you know I thought from the time that was just very uh, inventive thing to do you know a control situation <laughs> and a body and um, and then fast forward to uh, around 1950 there was a gentleman who a lot of uh, who did it we used the way you would kind of think it would be done using a tube and a collecting Bag, but that's actually incredibly uncomfortable, and no one will sign up for your study. Uh, the, the thing that I most liked about this guy was his name. His name was Colin Leakey. <laughs> true, true, true. No, no, it's not. Look it up. Go on PubMed. Go on PubMed. Colin. And by the way, I happen to have a 12-year-old boy here, so if you want to show this one, uh, yeah, Colin Leakey. It's possible he pronounced it Colin, but I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> to me, he will always be Colin Leakey. This is absolutely true. Uh, so anyway, that was that. Uh, Colin Leakey. His his story. He, he didn't work so well. Then there was Michael Levitt, who is a researcher who, when the gas chromatograph was developed, his advisor said to him, you know what, nobody's used this thing on intestinal gas. Why don't you give it a whirl? Like, All right. So he did that. He ended up doing 34 papers on human intestinal gas. Uh, and and in, the, in the conversation we had, he said, it still, to this day, overshadows everything I do. <laughs> if you look up Michael Levitt on Google Images, you get a few pictures of him, and then you get a can of baked beans. <laughs> uh, anyway, so. Uh, flatulence also you could, um, the way it's done uh, these days is with a mylar balloon. Okay, and it's not put where you, where you would think. Uh, it's inflated, you, 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 first of all, you eat a pint of beans. And I did this at the, the Beano Company as a, a research lab, and they were doing some kind of research. And I said, oh, I'd like to be a subject. But then the way you do it is you, uh, you inflate a mylar bag, and then they measure how much hydrogen is coming off your breath, you know, from the beans being broken down in your colon, uh, your leaky colon. And then they, from, the, from the, the hydrogen on your breath, they can extrapolate how much is coming out the other end. So they have a pretty good idea, and I think so they can do it that way. Um, and then I said to Alan Kligerman, the director of research there, I said, you know, I don't know about this, because if you're the kind of person who holds in, like my mother-in-law, no one has ever heard this woman pass gas ever. So she's obviously like holding it in. If you hold it in, you're going to absorb more into your bloodstream. It's going to come out on your breath, and it's going to artificially inflate your high breath hydrogen level. So you're going to appear to be a very flatulent person, and maybe you're not. You're just holding it in. So I, I presented this to Alan Kligerman. I said, don't you think you know, if you hold it in? And he goes, Mary, I. I honestly don't know the ultimate fate of a suppressed fart. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
kind of kind of quote I live for. But I I am not ashamed to say that I am a, a producer. I was able to take part in the study because I am a producer. I ate my beans and I was a producer. I believe that my husband is an executive producer. <laughs> Also not here tonight. <laughs> 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 I'm going to. I'm going to uh, end by reading. Um, now I leave lots of time for questions. People have the most amazing questions. One guy said recently, he raised his hand. He said, "You know, when you eat hot foods, you develop a tolerance, and we get it, which is correct. You, you're actually destroying some of the pain receptors in your mouth, so it doesn't feel as uh, as hot." Is painful. Uh, and he said, why don't you develop a tolerance on the other end? <laughs> I thought that was a great question. I have no idea why. Uh, but thankfully, well, no, sadly, you don't. <laughs> so I'm going to read a short passage here. Um, and then we're going to have lots of fun questions. <laughs> OK. Um, Those who know the human gut intimately see beauty not only in its sophistication, but in its inner landscapes and architecture. In a 1998 issue of the New England Journal of Medicine, two Spanish physicians published a pair of photographs, one being the haustrations of the transverse colon, and that's kind of looking, you're looking down uh, the, 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 the segments, the, entry, the entryway between a couple of segments, is, um, it's very architectural, um, side by side, with the arches of an upper floor arcade in Gaudi's La Pedrera. <laughs> they really look a lot alike. They wonder if maybe Gaudi had been inspired somehow. Uh, uh, anyway, I was inspired, and I uh, wanted to see my own internal Gaudi. I had my first colonoscopy without drugs. Oh, God. Yeah. There is an, uh, an unnameable feeling I've had maybe 10 times in my life. It is a, mixer, a mix of wonder, privilege, humility, and awe that borders on fear. I have felt it in a field of snow on the outskirts of Fairbanks, Alaska, with the northern lights whipping overhead so seemingly close, I dropped to my knees. I am walloped by it on dark nights in the mountains, looking up at the sparkling smear of our galaxy, laying eyes on my own ileocecal valve, peering into my appendix from within, Bearing witness to the magnificent complexity of the human body, I felt, let's be honest, mild to moderate cramping. <laughs> <laughs> but you understand what I'm getting at here. Most of us pass our lives never once laying eyes on our own organs, the most precious and amazing things we own. Until something goes wrong, we barely give them thought. This seems strange to me. How is it that we find Christine Aguilera more interesting than the inside of our own bodies? <laughs> It is, of course, possible that I seem strange. You may be thinking, wow, that Mary Roach really has her head up her ass. <laughs> <laughs> to which I say, only briefly, and with the utmost respect. <laughs> about this book. They could be about uh, any of my previous books, my personal life. You, somebody raise their hand. Yes, sir. You were just talking about your experience. Uh, did you have any kind of drugs? The colonoscopy. No. I, what I had is the, the way that they do it in Europe and Asia frequently is a, a, a sedation on demand. So the IV is there. It's ready to go if you ask for it. And 80% of people in the study that I read did not Requested, and I'm not saying it's comfortable. It's not like a massage. It's it hurts. Uh, it only hurts when you go when they go around the corner because the the, the colon it, it doesn't feel pain from cutting or burning it when you stretch it. But it's because your body's saying, "Hey, it's gonna rupture. Hell, you gotta do something about this." So going around the corners, you're you're like, "Ah!" <laughs> and you're okay, and then they do it. You know, so yeah, you know, it doesn't take five minutes. It's not a, it's bearable. It's not that bad. Um, and I was just really interested to learn how uh, how differently it's done here in the United States. How much sedation, and sometimes to the point of I think general anesthesia sometimes. Mm -hmm. 
that, that that just seems like overkill. Um, anyway, so uh, I don't recommend it as a fun time, but I was able to get up and we can go about the rest of my day, which was nice. So, and, and I don't know, but for the next one, hmm, I, mean, I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So more more questions? Yes. So there's Kegel exercises. Is there anything for the anus for that type of exercise? Ah, Kegel, yeah. Um, if you mean for like anal incontinence, probably. Yeah. Uh, see, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I don't know say it. Like, um, I don't know, but I bet that there. I bet there is. Okay. I bet I bet you that that would be because yeah because it uh, when you lose the muscle tone, muscle tone right that's the, that would be the problem so I'm guessing here but I uh, yeah I don't know there is however there's a wonderful um, there's something called paradoxical sphincter contraction okay this is so people who they who um, tend to not go when they feel the urge they they you know they clench it and they wait so they develop a habit when they go into the bathroom instead of opening the sphincter they clench it down and so you're pushing and then you're clenching and, and you're like why can't i go around so there's a, a, a little video game they hook you up with a little it's a feedback thing and it's called the egg drop and you're like you're, like, you're, you're clenching and, and, letting, and, and lining up the eggs to drop uh, and the california egg advisory board also has this egg drop game so i don't know who came up with it for what first but um so yeah, I, I would, I would guess that if there's that, there probably are anal kegeling techniques. <laughs> yes. Um, I was wondering, in packing for Mars, that to me the picture of what it would be like to be an astronaut was so unbelievably unpleasant. I couldn't imagine anyone possibly wanting to do it. it seemed worse, way worse than going to prison. <laughs> I was wondering if um, your book had any impact on the number of people who are interested in becoming astronauts. <laughs> I, I wonder. I, I definitely burst some people's bubbles with that book. But, um, you know, there's, there's a quote in there that uh, one of the guys at NASA Ames, he's going, the ju he said, okay, so you're, you're sleep deprived. You can't open a window. You're not well paid. You're not, I mean, he went on this whole list of, the food is terrible. You're uncomfortable. Your sinuses are swollen. He goes, can you think of a worse job? And I'm like, okay, I get your point, but I think I think um, you know, the, yeah, the food is uncomfortable. You're not sleeping well. The food is bad. To me, it's like backpacking. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I love the backpack. You're up, you know, you're, you're sleeping on something hard. You're eating food that's not very good. There are bugs. It's not, but you look around you and you look out your tent, and you're and there's no one around, and you're in this incredible place, and it doesn't matter that the food is awful. And the, so I think that for a, that astronauts, being in space is like backpacking times a thousand. And yeah, it is uncomfortable, but you can't beat the view. And what a thing to fly around. You're flying, you're weightless, and you're looking out at the Earth. And I think that that probably makes up for all of the discomfort and the boredom. But that's the amazing thing. People, astronaut, the, on the way to the moon, Gene Cernan, in his memoir, he goes, Funny thing happened on the way to the moon. <laughs> Not much. Should have brought some crossword puzzles on. You're bored. You're going to the moon and you're bored. Uh, but anyway, boredom is a factor. But anyway, I think, uh, I, I don't, I doubt it. I don't know. Uh, I may be a little bit of a right provider, a bit of a reality check for people. Way in the back. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. For, for somebody to have acquired the uh, admiration for the elegance and wonder of the human machine. Uh, you must have a science background, but I don't know anything about it. What is your science background? No, I don't have a science background. I have a BA in psychology. <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, I, no, I never did journalism either. I, uh, the way I do my research, I, uh, I depend upon the kindness of scientists. They are people who I go in there and they think I have a list of intelligent, detailed questions, but really what I'm doing is using them as unpaid tutors and eating up whole chunks of time and going, okay, okay, let's just, let's just talk a little bit about this in general. And they're so generous with their time and they're so helpful. Uh, so, um, no, I, don't, I do not have a science background. And I think that, that that is definitely a disadvantage, but it's also an advantage in that I am coming at the topic from the same place as a lot of my readers, which is 
a healthy curiosity, but not necessarily a detailed background. So the sense of wonder and curiosity is, you know, like, I, like I'm a bad person when I learned, why is it when you get out of bed, suddenly you have to pee, but you didn't when you were lying down. Okay, this is our friend the stretch receptor. You stand up, all the pee gathers on the bottom, stretches out the bladder, triggers the, I have to go. I'm like, God, that's why, it's so cool. And so, well, as a urologist learned that, I don't know, 35 years ago, I'm like, yeah, duh. So, so I have the, I'm not the yeah, duh, kind of, uh, I'm coming at it from that perspective, yeah. Yes, in the red. Um, well, doing all this research on food and everything, would, it, would you say it affected your diet or the foods you eat in any particular way? Did it affect the diet or the foods I eat? Not so much, but it did affect how I eat and drink because I learned something cool. I learned about the internal nostrils. You all have two sets of nostrils. There's these, and then there's uh, some in the back of the mouth uh, that lead up into the nose. and you are, when you exhale, when you have wine in your mouth or food or olive oil, whatever it is, and it's in your mouth, there are these gases being released, these vapors, and you exhale and you're blowing it up into the nose. So you're smelling it on the exhale too. So, and I started doing that and I hold wine in my mouth and I'm like, yeah, I think I look funny and weird, but uh, you, you, the appreciation that I have for the foods I eat now is, is much improved because I'm, I'm able to just sample a lot more of those volatile aromas and so that uh, that's changed you can't get too carried away though with that blowing it you know because then you could get uh, you could do what's called nasal regurgitation where it actually comes out it comes out the nose Kids, kids, it's mostly kids that. because for two reasons, they're laughing while they're eating. They're laughing while they're uh, uh, drinking milk or whatever, and it comes out the nose. And uh, also kids have sometimes immature swallowing coordination. Swallowing is like a, a complicated ballet of moving parts. So, uh -oh, we've lost one. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so not so much what I eat, but how I eat. Yeah. You said that people have a uh, certain relationship with body fluids, but urine is known in a lot of cultures and new age. Yes. Uh, that it has a healing properties, and some people drink it in all the marine countries. So, <laughs> so yes. What, what they have. have can you repeat the, the question? The question is uh, um, she was referring to, and I made a statement about we have, uh, uh, there's a, the bodily fluids are mostly fairly taboo substance. You don't want to. A year a bit of revulsion for them, but there is an Ayurvedic, I believe, this tradition of, drink, of drinking one's own urine. Yes, um, but I would say that's a minority of the population. <laughs> and then they might have had. I think even they might have had a little bit of difficulty the first time they took a slug of urine. I'm just guessing. <laughs> uh, show of hands. Show of hands. Urine drinkers. Urine drinkers. You know, uh, I'm actually uh, uh, for the for the space book. Uh, uh, it's possible that the astronauts have a very effective uh, urine recycling system that turns it into drinking water. Wow. And you, they'll do taste tests, they'll have journalists come in and go, here's tap water, one of these is tap water, and one of it's treated urine, and I defy you to know which is which. Wow. And um, they aren't able to tell, so, uh, and I, as part of that, I, I, I processed some of my own urine, and. I left it in the refrigerator overnight in a bottle, and yeah. my husband was like, what is this? <laughs> I'm like, well, for tomorrow. I'm going down to NASA to have lunch with the guy, and we're going to drink our own beer. And he's like, you left it in the refrigerator? Could you not have put it on the porch? <laughs> and I tried to explain, you know, it's been treated. It's an you know, it process, and it's been, you know, it's been run through activated charcoal, and all the objective, you know, the offensive things are gone. And, and I decided, I said, I think that you would, you would never probably. He's like, no. And I said, well, what would the circumstances be for you to drink your own urine? He said, it would have to be apocalyptic. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously not an Ayurvedic practitioner. <laughs> um, yes. So I'm just a little curious about your research process. And so I have a specific example in mind. Like one of the best movies on YouTube is the clip of you. Um, talking about the Danish pig farmers yes. and getting pigs to have more orgasms or yes. more productive orgasms. Like, how do you find this stuff? <laughs> yeah, how did that get everybody here? The question was about my research and how, uh, that she mentioned in, 
in Bonk, there was a, um, a uh, well, it was a, in a TED talk, but, they, but there was a, a, a method of, of sexually doing things to a sound that the boar would do in order to uh, make her aroused and orgasmic, uh, and thereby upping the farrowing rates, the, the likelihood, that the, the, the number of pigs produced. So there's a technique, and I was there for to watch the Danish pig inseminators practice this technique. And it looks, it doesn't look sexual. It looks like a Monty Python sketch. There's a whole like lift here and push here with your fist, and you wouldn't know what's going on except if you were a Danish pig inseminator. <laughs> Uh, where did I hear about that? You know, for the life of me, I can't remember where I came across my friends on the Danish pig inseminating circuit. I don't know, but a lot of you know, I turn over a lot of rocks, and every time I find somebody to talk to, I say, "Who else should I talk to? Who do you know?" Now you have a sense of what I do and who I am and what kind of what a gooder I am. Who should I see? So it's like it's a lot of talking to people. Sometimes going on. You know, like for stiff, for example, you go on PubMed database of all these medical journal articles, and you put in the word cadaveric, and that will lead you to people doing interesting work with um, cadaveric tissue and, and, and bodies. So there's just there's ways to kind of find who the players are out there, and then kind of do your homework, and then you, you want to just email them. And I never know what people are going to be like until I get there. You know, I never like the Ahmed Shafiq, the guy in Bonk, who. Um, I came across him by doing a PubMed search. Uh, he'd done a lot of work on the reflexes of sexual intercourse, and I was looking through his papers, and one of them was about the effects of polyester on sperm count. <laughs> and in his paper, he had a drawing, and the caption was, figure one, the underpant worn by the rat. And it is a drawing of a rat wearing a little tiny drawstring polyester pants that he had made upon the Cairo to see to meet this man. I don't know if he's legitimate or what he is, but I'm going. And uh, he, he was he, he did not disappoint. I got there and uh, Professor Shafiq was wearing a bright blue polyester suit. Polyester. And I went like this, I went, it's polyester. And he said, yes, but underwear never. <laughs> Did you did you find anything in your research about the whole digestive system? Is there one area where you think they, you know, the scientists really know a lot less about, or do they really know everything about everything? They are only now beginning to understand the microbiome, the back, you know, the the, the role of the, the, the trillions of bacteria in your gut and what they do. And um, you know, for a long time, researchers have looked at what we eat in terms of preventing disease or helping remedy disease. And it's turning out that the, the bacteria that you have, that, that like the food is just the, the raw goods, and then it's broken down into different components, and those may be the things to look at. So it's gotten more complex, but also more um, exciting. And, there's all, and, and, and be just changing people's microbiome is a powerful way, uh, is seeming to be a powerful way to treat illness. It's really in the infancy now, but there's so much work going on. And, uh, so much to be learned. I mean, because there's such a variety of bacteria, and 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 so many of them. And, and you know, in order to anyway, that area is is just taking off, and it's, uh, a, a lot of potential there. Yeah. Actually, right uh, along that same line, you mentioned the fetal transplants earlier. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. I mean, were there any uh, gems from that research that didn't quite make it into the book that you're going to share? <laughs> um, Oh, if they're gems, they're usually in okay. the <laughs> uh, Well, yeah, I, I went to um, Minneapolis, uh, the, the, the researcher who's done a lot of work in this area, and did the, the C. diff, one of the big C. diff studies. And I said, can I come in, can I see how this is done? And he said, it's very simple. It's a donor, a guy comes in with a bag. And the day that I was there, he came, he did, he came in with his bag, and he said, not my best work. <laughs> Uh, so there's the bag, okay, and then there's some distilled water, I believe it is, and then it's put in a blender, just under a fume hood, may I say also, under a fume hood. Uh, it's in a blender, and so you have it, and it's looking like coffee with some skim milk in it. 
And the fumes have gone up the hood, and uh, and it's put, it, it's put into the patient via the same tool that's used for a colonoscopy. There's just a plunger attachment, so it's very quick and simple, and very effective. And uh, so it was it was you know both surreal and, and bizarre, and also very inspiring because this patient was by the weekend. And he said on Saturday night, I had a solid bowel movement, and that's not like. Maybe yours and my idea of a great Saturday night, but for this guy, I mean, it was really moving. You know, was really moving. No, no, honestly, I didn't mean that. People ask me, people ask me, like, oh, how do you come up with your ideas for books? And I go, like, oh, it's a process of elimination. I get away from it, I don't need them. Yes. Um, yes. If we can go to the upper end. Yes, please. Okay, great. <laughs> Swallowing air, and what happens with air in the stomach that yes. is swallowed? Uh, uh, aerophagy, yes. swallowing air. Uh, and some people do that without realizing a lot of it. And that is burped out. Uh, burps are swallowed air for the most part. Also, if you're drinking if it's fizzy water or beer, something carbonated that's giving off gas, that is coming up, back up. But if you swallow air, and eat, it'll, when you eat, you take in some air. And you can intentionally swallow air if, if like me and my brother on long car trips who would have burp contests. <laughs> uh, anyway, aerophagia. And, and there, are, there, there are, yeah, there are people who do it unconsciously and a lot. And they go to the gastroenterologist and they're like, I, I keep belching. And I don't really know why. You know, they, they, like gastroenterologists are going, because you're swallowing, look, you're swallowing air. Like, what do you mean? They don't, they don't necessarily see it or, or realize that they're doing it. So anyway, that's aerophagia. Yes. Yes. Um, so you talked about being a, a sort of getting the topics that nobody else would touch. And yeah. I also noticed there seems to be, it kind of lead from one to another. Like, I felt like packing for Mars a lot of research about the food and the bathroom mm -hmm. may have yes. led to Adventures in the Elementary Canal. Bingo, yes. <laughs> so where has this book taken you? What's next? Uh, this book has not taken me to the next book. The next book I'm keeping under my hat for now, but it did not. Um, uh, this one didn't lead directly to the next one. But you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, some of the elements in one study in particular that I came across when I was doing Packing for Mars, about they were trying to figure out for a Mars mission, this was back in the 60s when they were brainstorming, we're going to go to Mars, how will we feed the astronauts? We can't carry all this stuff. We're going to have to grow it. And they thought, what's the simplest source of, what's a food source? And they thought, okay, bacteria. And this was at UC Berkeley, the nutrition department. And they made this meal of dead bacteria and fed it to people. And, it was just, and I thought, wow, well, wow, the science of what is food and what we eat and what, it just, there's, it can go to places that are very strange and interesting. So that was sort of an inspiration. Yeah, you're right.